Oh, dear friends, when I uh, look back over 54 years, I remember the time when I knew packing all of the highs in the United States. And I thought uh, yesterday when Mrs. Long here was speaking, we're so deep in the cause today that no one thinks they can encompass it any longer. It's gone beyond us to such a great extent. But it's such a great inspiration to come to this summer school, a first summer school, and see the response of the friends in starting it up. And it's, it's a sign that we're very close to the time when the Lily Master said uh, people will enter the cause in troops. We don't know how this is going to happen, but we do know it's going to happen because it's a promise of the beloved Master that this will happen. Now, I'm not going to give a regular talk. I'm going to give uh, some highlights for motivation, things of that kind, and talking about the beloved Master and try to show you uh, those values that really take root in our souls and make us active. Unless they do take root in our souls, we don't become active. If it's a heart, con if it's a head consciousness, we can know all about the faith. As Ruvia Conum said, facts were not half as important as the spirit. So in dealing with this subject today, after Baha, I'm not going to go in and talk all of the uh, things that are obvious to you, because you can read that in God Passes By and the World Order Letters and things of that kind. I just want to talk about some of the highlights about Abu Baha. And first I wanted to uh, read this prayer of uh, Allah because I want you to see in this prayer the position we are in as believers. You know it. We sometimes read these prayers, but we don't read them and think about them as we read them. And this is a morning prayer. And he says, I give praise to thee, O my God, that thou hast awakened me out of my sleep and brought me forth after my disappearance and raised me up from my slumber. I have awakened this morning with my face set towards the splendors of the day's star of thy revelation, through which the heavens of thy power and thy majesty have been illumined, acknowledging thy signs, believing in thy book, and holding fast unto thy cord. I beseech thee by the potency of thy will and the compelling power of thy purpose, to make of what thou didst reveal to me, unto me in my sleep the surest foundations for the mansions of thy love that are within the hearts of thy chosen ones, and the best instrument for the revelation of the tokens of thy grace and loving kindness. Do thou ordain for me through thy most exalted pen, O my God, the good of this world and of the next. I testify that within thy hands, thy grasp, are held the reins of all things. Thou changest them as thou pleasest. No God is there save thee, the strong and the faithful. Thou art he who changes through his bidding abasement into glory, weakness into strength, powerless into might, fear into, uh, fear, fear into calm, and doubt into certainty. There is no God but thee, the mighty, the beneficent. Thou disappointest no one who has sought thee, nor dost thou keep back any one who desires thee. Ordain thou for me what becometh the heaven of thy generosity and the ocean of thy bounty. Thou art verily the Almighty, the most powerful. So you see in that morning prayer of Abba Baha that our destiny is in his hand, God's hand. That let my destiny, which is written by thy greatest pen, be to attain the blessings of this life and the life to come. This shows us that we have to change our attitude. We have to have an attitude as Baha'is of humility and humbleness and letting go of pride. Pride is a very subtle thing. We think we have our preconceived ideas of the environment we've come out, of, out from, and it's very difficult for us to let it go of these preconceived ideas and say to myself, I don't know what's good for me, but God knows. You see, I don't think there's anyone in the room, if they are honest, can say to themselves they know what is best for them at any point of their life. But by putting yourself in the hands of God, I lay all my affairs in thy hand. Thou art my guide and refuge. You see, then you, this is a position of humility of understanding where you know that you're dependent upon God. And this is the point of view I want you to catch when I talk about the Master, because here is a being, the third of the central figures of the faith, the beloved Master, who is in the history of religion centuries behind, back of us. 
You know, there's many quotations in the Bible that refer to the Master, which show that he was in the history of the faith. But it's the first time in the history of religion that we have had a, a divine being in our midst as the perfect exemplar, the stainless mirror, the limb of the law of God. The person in that place occupies these wonderful net titles. And I wanted to read to you a statement of uh, about there are, four, there are four or five I picked out of the Bible statements about Daniel. I don't know whether you want to take them out. I'll just give a reference. You can look them up. Daniel 7, 5 and 6. Zechariah 3 and 8. Daniel 7, 13. <laughs> Daniel 7, 5 and 6. This is a, this is a, that first one is a reference to Baha'u'llah, the Bab, and Abba Baha. Zechariah is a reference to the branch. And also a world order letter, page 133. Then in Daniel 7.13, in Isaiah 2.3, and in Isaiah uh, 8, 6, and 7. Now, I wanted to, you're familiar with the, the passage in the Chosen Highway by, uh, this is uh, Plumfield. But well, we don't know the last part of that statement. You see, the part they quoted in there, this statement that you're familiar with, but I wanted you to read the last, hear the last part of the statement of Vali Ali Khan's uh, son, Vargas' son. I'll read the whole thing and then follow on to the last that's not published in the book, and then I'll make a comment about it. The Master, Vali Ali Khan, the son of the glorious Persian martyr, said, My father was much with Baha'u'llah. One night, Baha'u'llah, as he strode back and forth in his room, said to him, At stated periods, souls are sent to earth by the Creator with what we call the power of the great ether. Which is the Holy Spirit. And those who possess this power can do anything. They have all power. Jesus Christ had this power. The people thought of him as a poor young man whom they had crucified, but he possessed the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he could not remain underground. This ethereal power rose and quickened the world. And now look to the Master, for this power is his. So you see, in this station of the beloved Master, Abdul Baha, this term, Abdul Baha, is the highest term you can think of when you realize to come into contact with the station of Abdul Baha. I'll explain to you. Now this goes on, the part that is not published in the book. Baha'u'llah added Valiullah Khan, taught my father much about the Master. The Master, you know, is one of the titles of Abdu'l Baha, and the greatest branch is another. Baha'u'llah, the blessed perfection, revealed the station of Abdu'l Baha to my father. And my father wrote many poems to the Master. Though the master would chide him and say, you must not write such things to me. But the heart of my father could not keep quiet. Once he wrote, oh, dawn in place of the beauty of God, I know thee. Thou, though thou wrappest thyself in ten thousand veils, I know thee. Though thou should wear the tatters of a beggar, still would I know thee. Now, you see, Valio Le Khan uh, said his father couldn't help it after he re having this station revealed to him. And I remember back in New York in 1920, there, period, talking to Hooper Harris, one of the well-known Baha'is in the East, who the master peg-posted in New York City to teach the Senate of the Covenant. There's some wonderful experiences about the Senate of the Covenant in the East I'll try to tell you about. It. And he was curious about the station of the master, so he wrote to the master about the station, his station. And the master says, Turn with your heart, your breast to me, and I will reveal this station to thee. So when an answer came back, I asked Mr. Harris, I said, did Abdul Baha reveal this station to you? He says, yes. I said, why can't you tell me? He says, I can't tell you about it. You'll have to find it yourself. So I want to, in telling you this story, friends, I want to tell you, this is a case of meditation. This is a case of creation of the creative word, so that you reflect upon the creative word and get yourself out of the way so that you can be this read. Now we know, as was stated, that none of us are really worthy of this message. There's no question about that. But the fact that we have received it 
It's, this, it's pure bounty and pure grace that we have this cause of God. And this makes us more humble the more we realize that it is a bounty. I remember Mr. Wilhelm and I talking in New York Strait one day, and he says, isn't it a strange thing like a couple of punks like you and I should have this message and there's so many more wonderful people that should have it? <laughs> so this, this is, a, I tell you this story to, to see that we must continually have this attitude that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that touches it may, that brings all these bounties to us. Now, of course, we know that Shilgi Bendy, speaking of Abdul Baha, the strange thing about, I like the mysteries of the faith. Shilgi Bendy said if the cause of God didn't have mystery in it, it would cease to be the cause of God. He said the American friends are trying to make an American Baha'i cause out of it. <laughs> You see, so we never, uh, we want to overlook the fact that we're dealing with a deep mystery. And we only come into these mysteries as we respond to the teachings. Now, what a wonderful thing that Abdul Baha was born at the exact hour that the Bob declared himself. Then I want to digress and talk to you about Sheikh Ahmad and Sayyid Qazim. And to think, here's one of the greatest proofs of the revelation when Sheikh Ahmad was in Tehran, Persia. You remember when he went there for the purpose of being at the birthplace of Baha'u'llah and the Shah invited him to dinner and then the son of the Shah also insisted upon Sheikh Ahmed coming to see him which was a disappointment to Sheikh Ahmed because he had to give up his visit to Tehran but before he left Tehran he prayed that the people of Persia would know who was born in their midst that day now here is before anyone knew anything about Baha'u'llah here are the two twin stars, Sheikh Ahmed and Sayyid Qazim, who were given this knowledge. This is a very significant thing, friends, because this is parallel with the early disciples of Jesus Christ and the wise men at that time. Because if you go in, uh, when you know, Jesus is talking to the disciples, he didn't tell them they had found out this information. He said, to you it is given to know. You see what's a different thing? It is given to know. To the multitudes I speak in parables, they neither see, hear, nor understand. So as you can see, this is a gift. Now the guardian, the beloved guardian, Shoghi Benny wrote of Abdul Baha, his has been a unique distinction of recognizing why still in his childhood the full glory of his father's as yet undisclosed station, a recognition which has impelled him to throw himself at the feet and to spontaneously implore the privilege of laying down his life for his sake. Now I have a tablet of the Mass in which he says that every prophet is the atom of his revelation. The beginning of creation is the beginning of the revelation of God in each cycle. And the first believer is Eve, and those who follow after are the children of Adam. Now we've had many Adams. You go through the promulgation of universal peace and you'll find many places where Abdul Baha tells us that we're all sons and daughters of Father Adam. Now, I wanted to uh, read you two or three uh, impressions of Abdul Baha. And I picked these out of many, but and one of Mr. Holly's and uh, Khalil Gibram, the poet, and an atheist, and Lee McClung, who was the treasurer of the United States government. Some of you may be familiar with this, but I want their excellent references. And especially that of Mr. Hawley and Mr. Cuthbert of London. Because Mr. Hawley, especially, you'll see that uh, when uh, the Holy Spirit touches a person, they can't get away from the experience. It stays with them the rest of their life. I'm going to read Mr. Hawley's first, because you'll see Mr. Hawley, by the way, uh, was a very gay blade in Paris when he was a young man. We know him as a very sedate person in the convention, but if you know him, I met a, a lady who told me all about him when he was in, in Paris. <laughs> and she said he was quite a gay blade. He ran a bookstore. And uh, at that time, as when he contacted Abdul Baha in uh, Switzerland, in uh, Thornton. And you'll see in this statement of, of, of Horace, which is a wonderful statement, and the impression the Master made upon him. Horace had nothing to do with this. This is something that happened. This is what happens to all of us when they come in, more or less. Mr. Hawley went to Thornton to meet Abdu'l-Baha. 
In the garden at the Hotel du Parc, groups of people were walking around in, under the trees and sitting at tables and listening to orchestra, an orchestra playing nearby. Suddenly, my wife pressed my arm and said, Look, there is Monsieur Dreyfus conversing with us. He at the same time recognized us and the party rose. I saw among them a stately old man robed in a cream-colored gown, his white hair and beard shining in the sun. He displayed a beauty of stature, an inevitable harmony of attitude and dress I had never seen or thought of in men. Without having ever visualized the master, I knew that this was he, capital A. My whole body underwent a shock. My heart leaped. My knees weakened. A thrill of acute receptive feeling flowed from head to foot. I seemed to have turned into some most sensitive sense organ, as if my eyes and ears were not enough for this sublime impression. In every part of me, I stood aware of Abdelbaha's presence. From sheer happiness, I wanted to cry. It seemed the most suitable form of self-expression at my command. While my own personality was flowing away, a new being, not my own, assumed its place. A glory, as it were, from the summits of human nature poured into me, and I was conscious of a most intense impulse to admire. In Abdu'l-Bahá, I felt the awful presence of Baha'u'lláh, and my thoughts returned to activity, and as my thoughts returned to activity, I realized that I had thus, as near as man can, maybe, to pure spirit and pure being. This wonderful experience came to me beyond my volition. I had entered the Master's presence and become the servant of a higher will for its own purpose. After that seemed a cycle of existence. This state passed with a deep sigh, and I advanced to accept Abdu'l-Bahá's hearty welcome. To look upon so wonderful a human being, to respond utterly to the charm of his presence, this brought me continual happiness. I had no fear that its effect would pass away and leave me unchanged. Now, you know the life of Horace Holly for 36 years as secretary of our National Spirits Assembly. And I can tell you some interesting stories about the early days of those struggles. We had the Republicans and the Democrats in the early conventions. <laughs> and lots of times the Republicans had tried to unseat the Democrats. And one time, I remember when they, uh, a couple got together and they went around uh, asking different delegates if they vote such in such a way to remove Horace as secretary. <laughs> and along came a cablegram, but after the convention was over, Horace was elected. And this party went around asking these different delegates if they had voted this way, and they all said yes, so she said, someone lied. <laughs> but a cablegram came from the beloved guardian referring to Mr. Holly as my very capable co-worker. So God protects us in the, in the state. In this connection with this uh, impression of the Master, I want to leave with you this statement of the Master in which he said, I hope you will allow the Holy Spirit to work out its destiny through you. So you see, Horace's response to the destiny, his destiny, the presence of the Master, was such an unusual response, and so impressed, the Master knew who Horace was. He called him for that service. Just as Paul Haney, Mrs. Haney told me that the Master said, he called Paul to it. Before he was born, he called for Paul. You see, these are the things we want to reflect upon. We're not dealing with some human element that we can rationalize about. We're dealing with a divine experience in human affairs, which if we're alert to it, will guide us to these inner experiences of the faith which are the most important to all of us. Magnify my command that I may reveal the secrets of greatness to thee, is Baha'u'llah's statement. You see. Not taking ourselves serious, but taking the cause of God serious. This is the important thing. Now this one of Mr. Cuthbertson is a wonderful one. And this is the one I've seen many times when I was in the presence of the beloved Master. Myself, I've witnessed this experience. He said, Abdu Baha will ever grow upon you, even if the meeting is only once. You will realize more and more that it is you that it is you have what it is you have been in the presence of and made contact with. Not a personality, nor a dazzling individual, 
But so wonderful a state of perfect attachment and consecration have you encountered that it seems as if you are lo being lovingly addressed by the Holy Spirit itself. It is a great lesson to us of man's perfect attainment. We see before our eyes the attitude towards God each one of us ought to assume so that each one in his place may be fully enabled to love all mankind abundantly and act with the greatest wisdom, always shedding around him joy and happiness. As you look at Abdu'l Baha's, as you look at Abdu'l Baha, a veil <coughs> seems to come over his eyes, and you wonder where he is gazing. He, is, he the individual person, seems to have been eclipsed by the very divine spirit of God. Abdu'l-Ha is there, but only as the material focal point perfectly serving the light, as an existing object upon which the invisible radiance impinges, and thus becomes manifested unto us in all manner of wise, loving, and fruitful ways. So does the reality of Abdu'l-Ha impress the soul as it advances. And you know, I want to tell you a little story about this one about Khalil Gibran. In Phoenix, Arizona, in May, I was speaking to her at a fireside, and there was a young lady there who kept watching me. So much so it attracted my attention. She kept focusing her attention, and she once or twice tried to ask the question, and she was seemed to be timid, never asked it. And after me was broke up, uh, a thought flashed in my mind, go over and ask her if she'd like to know what Khalil Gabram said. So I walked over and I said, would you like to know what Khalil Gibram said about Abdul Wahab? That's the very question I wanted to ask you. You see, this is the, the, what the alertness I mean. We should be aware of that when these thoughts come to us, act upon them. Well, Khalil Gibram said, for the first time I saw a form noble enough to be the receptacle of the Holy Spirit. And I have a, in uh, Mahmoud's diary here, Lee McClum, who was treasurer of the United States, invited Abdul Hall to his home, and Abdul Hall went to his home for dinner. And then there were several friends there afterwards. And as they bid him goodbye, Mr. McClum walked over and embraced the master and wept as he left. He was so impressed with his meeting of the master. Now, I want to come back here to carry this same thought through, to keep us on this idea of, uh, of humility and the realization of the station we occupy as human beings. In this wonderful little book of Dr. Townsend's on the heart of the gospel, and this, that paragraph on the overlord of evolution, he said, uh, Beside me there is no God. Turn to me and you are saved all ends of the earth. As I am God and God alone, I swear by myself that every knee shall bow to me and every tongue swear loyalty. The rules of my religion I send forth to light up every nation. I point to you to bring light to the nations, that my salvation may reach the world's end. Woe to the man who quarrels with his maker, man a mere potter of the earth. Does the clay ask the potter what he is doing? Does what he makes tell him he is powerless? Would you question me about the future? Would you dictate to me about my work? So that you can see, even in the Old Testament, the New Testament, we find the same theme of the humility that we should have when we approach this subject. The letting go of preconceived ideas. Adelha said this world is a workshop and not an art gallery for the refinement and development of our character. And he says a donkey can carry a whole library on its back. So you can see that uh, if we don't have this attitude, we just deprive ourselves. You can see that this isn't a coordinated talk. I'm just talking off the cuff. I'm going to say something, though, before I ask, so a little protection for me. If you take the words, deeds, and actions of any person in your way of knowing God, you'll be deprived of knowing it. So if I say something that might not agree with at the present time, I've got a blanket that maintains that statement. If people only realize it is the end of the this is from Shoghi Effendi in 1943. If people only realize that the inner life of the spirit is that which counts, 
but they are so blinded by their desires and so misled that they have brought upon themselves all the suffering we see at the present in the world. The Baha'is seek to lead back to the knowledge of their true selves and purpose for which they were created, and thus to their greatest happiness and highest good. And the Master said, Do not be satisfied with the outer words. Seek to understand their inner meaning. Now I heard quoted this morning that wonderful passage in the Hidden Words, Turn thy sight into thyself and find me standing within thee, powerful, mighty, and supreme. And Fred Lunt wrote to Shulgi Fenny about this passage, and Shulgi Fenny said this was not to be taken literally. That what was meant by this passage, and I have the quotation here, what was meant by this passage was that each and every one of us is a divine creation, the rational human soul, and this is the mighty sign of God standing within us. This is Dr. Pointe out this morning, of an appreciation of this divine creation in each other. Because when you look into the face of another soul, you see this creation of God Almighty, the divine, rational, human soul in each and every one of us. And this is what is standing within us. How much clearer that makes it for us. Now, lots of times in teaching the faith, we forget to walk with the other person. And Admiral Hall was very uh, careful when he came to this country he began immediately to remove the superstitions and the imaginations that the people had and their concepts about the reality. I have a tablet here where the Master said, I want to sort of save time, I have this in case you want the whole tablet, in which he said that all the were people of the world have created a God in thought, and this thought they worship. He didn't qualify it. He said, all the people have created a God in thought, and this thought they worship, so that it is impossible for them to comprehend unless they take a fifth step, which is the spirit of faith, faith in a divine plan. And when they catch this step into the next plan, then they have a basis of beginning. I want to take this on Friday, uh, Thursday night on the subject of man, the fruit of creation, which I'll go into that in a little more detail. But this ref- these three references to the Bible, what I mean by walking with the people, are the statements of the Master. And the first one was in the city temple in London. And he said, this book is the holy book of God and of celestial inspiration. It is the Bible of sal- salvation, a noble gospel. It is the mystery of the kingdom and its lights. It is the divine bounty and the sign of the guidance of God. The friends of God, Baha'i, should know the value of the Bible, for they are cognizant of the hidden mystery of this holy book. And then in another time, in one of the tablets, volume 1, 2, 18, he said, Thou hast written that thou lovest the Bible. Undoubtedly, the friends and maid servants of the merciful should know the value of the Bible, for they are the ones who have discovered the real significances and have become cognizant of the hidden mystery of this holy book. Then he said to a young man in Tabas, volume 2, 243, I beg of God through the confirmation and assistance of the true one that thou mayest show the utmost eloquence, fluency, ability, and skill in teaching the real significances of the Bible. Turn towards the kingdom of Abha and seek the bounty of the Holy Spirit. Loosen the tongue and the confirmations of the Spirit will reach thee. This applause that refreshes. Yes, go right ahead. The only limitation we have is the one we set for ourselves. Well, uh, Abdul Ha said that there are only two things that will benefit us in this life. One is supplication and invocation to God. Supplication and invocation to God are the two things, only two things that will uh, uh, benefit us in this life. And this is true in this respect to the statement you made. 
When we pray, uh, the Master said that the power of prayer is like water. It flows, it has no form, and it flows into a square vessel, it fills a square, an octagonal vessel, and so forth. So if we pray, the answer to prayer flows into our consciousness to the degree of our development. So the only difference in any one of us is a, is a, is a difference in degree of development. We're all on. The, we're all the sons and daughters of of God, and we. It's like the farmer. The master explained many times. He said the kingdom of God is like a farmer. He picks the ripen fruit. There's nothing wrong with the green fruit. They're going to be picked too when they ripen. But we're in different degrees of ripeness. So the cause comes to us not a minute too late or a minute too soon, but when we are ripe. I say the one statement that emphasizes this is. God screens us evermore from premature ideas until the time when the mind is ripened and then the time when we saw it not as like a dream. So actually what they meant then, yeah, yeah. yeah. is that it's up to determine yeah. when we are right. So it was in, it was in, it is within our hands to respond like the lily <laughs> facing the sun. And if we hold back and we have preconceived ideas and we say, well, I don't believe this and so forth, these are the blocks. But such a dramatic statement that we're in, and we're living in the time of the manifestation of God should make a person very careful to examine to see whether this is the real thing. You see, this is the thing that's important. I want to tell you tomorrow night when we have this uh, talk of an early pilgrimage, I can take you into a number of stories, and please forgive me for saying I so much, but this is purely the instrument of use that will show you these, ex- these experiences and the effect it has upon us. And that comes to any of us. I was thinking as Mark told that beautiful story of his pilgrimage today, the effect it had on him. You can see that even to, uh, it will always be so, that if a person has the right attitude, is receptive, they receive a great deal more. And Paul says, well, how is it that one son in a family of sons and daughters seems to get more than another son? And Paul says, because one son asks for more. Now, don't forget, Baha'u'llah has all the money, he has all the uh, treasures, spiritual and material, and we should ask. He wants to bestow upon us. He wants this response from us. And we don't respond that way because of pride. I was thinking to, uh, to go along with this same line to uh, that wonderful talk that Arthur gave us last night on the front. We don't have any way of uh, putting an envelope in a person's hand, asking them how much to give. It's purely a personal, spiritual response of each and every one of us. So, each one has to ask himself, have they contributed to the fund 12 months out of the year? And if they did, if everyone did contribute 12 months out of the year, or nine, take the 19 months, and you did it every year, and you could say to yourself, I haven't missed a 19 month, no matter if it was a dollar or so much. It's not the amount, but the fact that you get into the flow of the Spirit is the important thing. So that if every member of our community was contributing every month, we wouldn't have a budget problem. And the 330 assemblies, the actual budget for the 330 assemblies that would overrun our budget is $2,300 a year for the whole community. Some could, could give more than that, as you know, in the, when they gave us the budget. But if we analyze this one self and ask ourselves whether we really are sincere in the cause of God. See, this is the important. Sincerity. The Master was always talking about sincerity as the one element necessary to arrive at truth. We have to be sincere with ourselves. So if we would take this to talk that Mr. Uh, Dahl gave us yesterday, back to our community, and talk about it from a spiritual angle, because it is a spiritual equation that we're dealing with. It isn't a material equation. Take that statement he went. Spend undeterred by the fear of poverty and rely on the unseen power of the whole lot of planets. This is the secret of right living. How many have gone to the point where they could go to the place where they might uh, give a little more than they thought they did? How many of you uh, we, uh, have we tested ourselves to get down to bedrock where we didn't have any money and give to the cause? And see it come in through this power, this hidden power. man one time was talking to me and he says, Curtis, he says, I'd like to explain to me the uh, solution to the economic problem. So I quoted this uh, one, Pursue your profession, rely upon God, the source of all body. And this one, Spend on the tears by the fear of poverty, rely on the unseen power of the whole order of the secret of right living. I quoted two or three prayers like this. 
and give me bread through channels over which I have no control. Oh, he says, yes, I know those prayers, but how do you do it? <laughs> so I said to him, well, evidently you don't believe those prayers. You see, if you, if you read a prayer of that kind, which tells you to do that, and you aren't willing to try it out and get your shin skinned a number of times, God doesn't confirm you right at the first step of the trip. He confirms you when he sees you stick to it. What's that story about the postage stamp you told me? Oh, Harry, the philosophy of a two-cent stamp sticks to his job when it gets there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the way with the prayer. You have to try them out. Take this prayer when you leave the house in the morning. Oh, my God, I depart from the house, depending upon thee. Send down a blessing from thy presence, and bring me back in peace and righteousness as thou hast sent me forth. What's the use of saying a prayer like that if you don't have, expect to come back home that way? And you go forth in it. All the prayers are that same way. They're so vital, these prayers, that you have not a negative. Every prayer that you get is a positive confirmation of acting if we respond. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm digressing again. You see, this isn't along with the thought comes from I'm giving it to you. Uh, Mr. Kardam and Abdul Hall speaks about it. The spiritual diseases are those of the intellect. Those avenues that get us on down blind alleys lead us nowhere. You know what philosophy is? Is looking for a black cat in a dark night in a dark alley that doesn't exist. <laughs> so you can see, these things are the things that block people. Now, Shogi Benny, I was talking to the beloved guardian one day about psychology. They were uh, having uh, what I call glamour courses at one of our schools one time. One was on uh, a very speculative subject, and a young man had been invited to come down to Can from Canada to give a course on administration. Six people attended his class on administration, and 75 people went to the glamour course. So I was talking to the guy about these glamour courses, and he said, this shouldn't be done. He says, the friends should make companions of the Baha'i books and become familiar with the Baha'i literature and so forth. And then I told him about a glamour course was on psychology. And when I told him about that one, he says, well, psychology, he said, is a stimulant to the mind, but a waste of time. Now, we're not going out and telling this to the outside world, but we should certainly tell it to ourselves as Baha'is. Because if we get off on all these avenues of uh, blind alleys, we forget the essential, which is the delivering of the divine remedy. Now, the Master said to us, that the healing of all thy ills is remembrance of me, forget it not. It is the healing of the body, the mind, and the spirit. Now, if you don't believe it, you'll go to other things. I remember a young couple that the guardian told them to seek a psychiatrist. Go to the psychiatrist. So I said to this couple, a very good friend of mine, I said, you won't take his word for it either. And the friend says, what do you mean I won't? The guardian told me to go there. I said, but you wait. You come back, you won't do what the psychiatrist tells you. Well, they went. This was a case of they're about to have a separation. So they went to the psychiatrist, and the first question the psychiatrist asked him if they had a good religion. And the man was so mad he walked out of the office. <laughs> the wife, uh, he left the faith, and the wife went pining in South America. She was firm. So you see, the greatest service, of, the master said, the greatest service you can render the faith is firmness in the covenant. Now these two statements, if you read in the covenant, no soul is revived except through the power of the covenant, and no soul is illumined except through the power of the covenant. Now you can get the structure of the covenant, the details of the covenant, right down from the time of Noah and through Abraham, and all these connecting links that the Master gives you right down to the present time. This is the structure of the covenant. But read the fine print, the specifications. You see, if you have, someone says, I'm going to build a brick house, that's all right. The contract says, uh, you build, put up a brick house for me. It'll be red bricks and so forth. But along with the contract are specifications. And these specifications are the thing that help put up the house. Well, now when you read the, do the document of the covenant, the structure of the covenant, and it tells you such things that no soul is revived except for the power of the covenant, no mind is illumined except for the power of the covenant, then you go in to see what is meant by it. No soul is revived and no mind is illumined. And you turn to the creative word because we made a covenant of, with God not just to accept the structure, but to go into the specifications and apply them to our lives.
And this creates the firmness, and this creates the illumination of the mind, and this creates the revival of the spirit. See, it's going to the inner story. There's so much on that subject that... Uh, how not to see the faults of others? Now, this is going into the fine print. <laughs> Someone asked that before, how can we uh, stop seeing the faults in others? And he says, I will tell you. Now this is the specifications of the covenant. This is the fine print. Whenever you recognize the fault of another, think of yourself. What are my imperfections? And try to remove that. Do this whenever you are tried through the words and deeds of others. Thus you will grow and become perfect, more perfect. You will overcome self. You will not even have time to think of the faults of others. <laughs> Man is blind, yet he sees far. This is puzzling. We are in Paris, and we see the faults of the believers in America. And in Stuttgart. But we are so blind that we cannot see the faults of our, our own nose. And he pointed to his nose. On our face. While we are blind, we have far-sighted vision to America or to Germany. You must carry the glad tidings of the kingdom wherever you go and make the people happy. Awake them into greater activity and make them active. So this is a fine print. What are the ambitions of the Baha'is? Edward Hoss says, ambition in the sight of God is an abomination. Now I'm not talking about the ambition for spiritual development. I'm talking about the ambition that the man and the woman says, I'm going to get there regardless. You see, this time of ambition right over everybody else. But the ambitions of the Baha'is, one, pity and goodwill towards all mankind. Two, the rendering of service to humanity. To guide and enlighten hearts, each member must try to be kind to everyone and to show forth great affection towards every living soul. Humility towards God and constant prayer to him so as to be enabled to grow daily nearer to God. Always in every word and action to be faithful and sincere, so that each member may be known to the world as embodying the qualities of sincerity, faith, kindness, love, generosity, and bravery. That he, we may be detached from all that is not of God, attracted by the heavenly breath, divine being, so that the world may be know that a Baha'i is a perfect being. Just think of it. End of statement. A perfect being. That's a hard job for us, isn't it? Huh? That's the talk of Abdul Baha in Paris, November 6, 1911. Volume, Star of the West, Volume 2, page 19. Number 19, page 1. When does consciousness begin? You have asked at what point in man's evolution he becomes conscious of self. This consciousness of self in man is a gradual process. And does not start at a definite point. It grows in him in this world and continues to do so in the future spiritual world. Man can certainly recall past experiences in his evolution. And even when he leaves this world, it still remembers the past. Now another wonderful thing about we should have in this fine print of the faith is to learn to express ourselves in talking about the teaching. Because I told him when the Master said, don't be satisfied with the outer words, seek to understand their inner meanings. And years ago, in the early formation of the faith, when we were coming into the administration from the days of the Master, uh, the Master said that in 1921, he told me, he says, the friends only know my love at this time. Later on, they'll have to be disciplined. And we didn't know what he was talking about. But when the guardian came in, we came into the area of discipline. But then... At that particular time, the master used to clamp down on us. If we even uttered a word, it wasn't an exact quotation. And Shogi Penny wrote over, and he says, As regards the statement of our own views and explanations of the teachings, Shogi Penny believes that we should not restrict the liberty of the individual to express his own views so long as he makes it clear that these views are his own. In fact, such explanations are often helpful and conducive to a better understanding of the teachings. God has given man a rational power to be used and not killed. This does not mean, however, that the absolute authority does not remain in the revealed word. We should try and keep as near to the authority as we can and show that we are faithful to it by quoting from the words of Baha'u'llah in establishing our points. A couple of months ago, 
You know, I came in, a man said to me, Curtis, I think you're a fanatic. <laughs> and I said, what makes you think I'm a fanatic? Fanatic. He says, can't you quote anybody but the Guardian, the Hall and the Bahal? I says, can you give me any better ideas than they have to offer? And the next day, he, he apologized for it. He said, uh, I'm sorry I said that. He said, anyone else would have taken offense, but it didn't seem to bother you. <laughs> well, there was a time when it would have bothered me. <laughs> But it's true. Uh, you now, in teaching is another wonderful thing. And this is the fine print, too, again, on the cover. The believers, and particularly those who have not had sufficient experience in teaching, should be very careful in the way they present the teachings. Sincerity, devotion, and faith are not the sole criteria of successful teaching. Tactfulness, extreme caution, and wisdom are equally important. We should not be in a hurry when we announce the message to the public and we should be very careful to present the teachings in their entirety and not to all of them for the sake of others. Allegiance to the faith cannot be partial and half-hearted. Either we should accept the cause without any qualifications, whatever, or cease calling ourselves the highs. Pretty strong. The new believer should be made to realize that it is not sufficient for them to accept some aspects of the teachings and reject those which cannot suit their mentality in order to become fully recognized and active followers of the faith. In this way, all sorts of misunderstanding will vanish, and the organic unity of the cause will be preserved. That's in the news number, news behind news, page number 80, page 5. And then we know, uh, sometimes we take an easy way to become familiar with the teachings, and we don't get very far when we do. It's a struggle. The Guardian has mentioned a number of times that life without a struggle has no meaning, and that you, we have to make an effort, a strong effort, to acquire the teachings. And this statement of Abba Ha, the will is the center of focus of human understanding. We must will to know God, just as we must will to possess the life he has given us. The human will must be subdued and trained into the will of God. It is a great power to have a strong will, but a greater power to give that will to God. The will is what we do. The understanding is what we know. Will and understanding must be one in the cause of God. Now, I think we all understand that statement, don't we? I didn't say any no, so I think it's a different one. But... Uh, you come to the conclusion that your art, craft, trade, or profession is a secondary means to sustain you in life. And we're talking about maturity this, in one of the classes here. And the Master, as Baha'u'llah, in the Tablet of the Jolly Art, says that after you have reached maturity, then for you wealth and competence is needed. If it be acquired through an art, craft, trade, and profession, it's praiseworthy, especially for those who rise for the training of the nations. So as you can see how, how tremendous it is that the very first command that Baha'u'llah gives after recognition of the faith is to have an art craft trader profession. Look at, the, look at the demands that are coming upon us now as Baha'is. And we should pray for the material welfare of our activities. There's nothing wrong in asking for it. We're, we, had a, we went out of a period of a poverty psychology in the Baha'i faith, and, and the National Assembly sent Mamie Cedar around the country quoting from the writings on how important it was to engage in your profession and try to improve it and try to earn more money because affairs depend upon means, as the Master said. So we have to work at our art, craft, trade, and profession. So this, of the will, we take the art, craft, and profession because we know this is what God gave us to sustain us in this life. And we're fulfilling the fine print of the covenant by applying it to ourselves and knowing that what we do to the utmost perfection in our art, craft, and profession and following those qualities that sustain us in this art concentration of honesty and integrity and honor and dependability. These are the qualities that are so lacking in the social order today. You perhaps remember reading them several months ago in Look Magazine in which one of our the presidents of Yale University made the statement that the problem in our social order today was that there was no image of integrity in it. That's a pretty indictment. No image of integrity. And because people see everybody else giving away to the moral breakdown and the moral fiber of life in their, in their profession and everything else, that everybody's fallen into the same pattern. So when they find a Baha'i outstanding in these qualities, even if they sacrifice many times, 
This is an admirable thing to, as an example. Master Fez says these qualities are like the light of the sun in the social order that a person has. So we should see that uh, our life is that uh, making of the will of door through which the confirmation of the Spirit comes. Making the will of the door through which the confirmation of the Spirit comes. Now seeking after truth, many of us go after something else after we found the faith, and this is a uh, this is blameworthy because we're dealing with the divine remedy. And what are we as believers? We're being qualified as assistants to apply the divine remedy. This is what we're being trained for to apply this divine remedy. And if we deviate from it, we'll put something else in, mix it all up. So we're seeking for the truth, and Baha'u'llah we'll said, and this is the tablets on volume 1, page 229, it's just too bad we don't have the tablets printed again, because in there are so many marvelous statements of the Master on these simple remedies of the faith. But he said, No, verily, all the doors are closed except the doors of the kingdom of God. All the trees are without fruit except the tree of life planted in the paradise of God. All the winds are disquieting to the souls except the breeze of God. All the cups are turbid except the cup of the love of God. Every benefit vanishes except the food of heaven. It is incumbent upon thee to partake thereof. So you can see, everything drags us, uh, brings us back to feeding the Spirit upon the creative Word. This is the thing that revives us. And if we fail to do it every day, we, we don't become revived. We fall back into the pitfall of the world. And the guy says you can't blame the Baha'is very much for this condition we live in because we're so surrounded by materialism in everyday life that we have to strive daily through prayer and meditation to escape its environment because it will engulf us all. This is the flood that, uh, that hits humanity. Look at those words. You know where Baha'u'llah speaks in the Egon? He said there is no greater oppression in the world than to want to know where the truth is and not know where to find it. This is the thing in ego. And this is a book we've been waiting for for 2,300 years. And now I'll stop at the end of 2,300 years. I want one other thing, though, in the close, and it's a short thing to show you. Now, you know Dr. Eric Crow? Well, here's four subjects he commented on in our time, the time you and I are living on. And one was education. And Abba says, speaking of education, said, Give your child an education whereby he can earn a livelihood and let polite learning take care of itself. So you should see, a person has a material education where they can sustain themselves and be an independent person of all save God in society. Then they can go as far as they want on the arts and the crafts and the other things in life. When Dr. Frohm said, Mr. Dr. Frohm said this, education, by and large, the things taught children are useless and quite alien to their personal reality. It is a tragedy that our society puts so much value on data rather than insight, behavior rather than personal integrity, so much useful beauty gone to waste. Government, in comments, hypocrisy and deceit and maneuvering by cynical second-rate minds and hearts, no wonder that so few people trust their official leaders. Religion, what at one time was a dynamic structure mediating between man and his destiny and interpersonal responsibilities has become mere mechanical ritual that dwarfs men rather than strengthens them. And psychoanalysis. Far too many doctors, like the clergy, continue to practice something that deep in themselves they have ceased to believe. How can you help or cure a sick person if you yourself don't believe in the treatment? Now, those are men who are thinking in our time, and they're seeing way out. If I had time, I'd give you a much the next one from uh, Dr. Menninger on psychiatry. And Shoghi Fendi told Ozzy Whitehead that psychiatry was foolishness. Foolishness. And this, this man here, when they tell you about it, I'll tell you that Thursday night, on a Thursday afternoon, what he said. That was in, that was in look. You know, with these remarks, I want to preface my remarks by 
saying to you that uh, when I use this word I a lot, just disregard it because this, you can't do it. I happen to be a party to this thing, this experience, so I'm sharing these ideas and disregard the personality in connection with it. This is going back as a start 54 years ago, at the start, and then 43 years ago of this pilgrimage to Haifa in 1921. And I think you'll see as I tell this story that it parallels your own experience in many cases. We have all come out of varying, various environments, backgrounds, from which we've had to disencumber ourselves with preconceived ideas and things of that kind. And it's the cause of the hollow law that has made it possible for us to escape this environment and uh, disencumber ourselves from these things. Personally, I had a very uh, wonderful mother and father, which I'm very grateful to the fact that they were my mother and father. My mother, when she started out as a young lady, said that uh, having come from an orthodox background, Baptist background, determined that her children are not going to be raised with this dogma and superstition and fanaticism and was taught in her day. So she said when she started, when we were children, she said now, she knew the value of religion, but she didn't know the uh, the actual facts of it like no one else did at that time. But she knew that it was necessary to go to some Sunday school, so she said, you boys will have to go to some Sunday school. You can choose whatever you want to go to. But she says, remember, you don't have to swallow everything that's told to you, which is a good start out. And then, uh, naturally, because Mother's background was Baptist, we as a boy chose the Baptist Sunday School. I wasn't there six months till I met another young boy in Congregational Sunday School. And he said, why don't you come over to our Sunday School? We have a very nice ministry, plays baseball with us, and on Christmas he gives us Christmas presents. So I joined the Congregational Sunday School. <laughs> well, we ran, I ran the gamut from that, uh, start to everything. Christian science, new thought, theosophy, Unitarianism, the Ouija board, many other things. <laughs> and the Ouija board, just a humorous story, we were again in uh, San Diego, California a number of years ago with a friend of mine. There were several other boys there and we wanted to experiment with table lifting. So we were sitting upstairs in the dark room. We'd been sitting there half an hour expecting this table to rise if we got in the right spirit. Well, the mother of my friend was objected to this sort of thing, and she quietly sneaked up the back stairs and didn't let us know, and it was a dark room, and she opened the door, she let out a war hoop, well, the table went through the ceiling. <laughs> and when the lights were turned on, several of them were sitting back there with glassy eyes. <laughs> well, uh, my mother was a very dear friend of uh, Mrs. Latimer. George Latimer. Many of you know George Latimer. He was one of the early believers who traveled uh, across in the early days to meet Abdul Hall and wrote many articles that are published in our Baha'i magazine and other pamphlets they issued with uh, Harry Rand and others. And Mrs. Latimer and my mother were members of several clubs in Portland, Oregon. My mother was president of the Brownie Society there and Mrs. Latimer was also active in several other things. And uh, Every time Mrs. Lamb would get together with my mother, she'd talk about the Baha'i movement. And uh, they had very uh, brief information about who Abu Baha was in that day. They used to refer to him many times as a great philosopher in Persia, in, in the Holy Land. And they referred to the Baha'i faith as the Baha'i movement in those days. So Mrs. Lamb would give mother some little excerpt that had been typed up in New York from Roy Wilhelm. And now this sent around, and it had very little literature. We had the hidden words on two other items. And Mother would bring this material home to the family to try it out on the family. Well, every time she'd give me an excerpt from the hidden word or something like that, since I had gotten away from religion, oh, I forgot to tell you that after I had gone all these places, I finally adopted my father's point of view. He said, now, Curtis, he said, you don't have to go to any Sunday school or anything else to be a first-class citizen or straightforward in your life. He says, all you have to do is make up your mind to be honest and have integrity in those qualities. You don't have to go anywhere to have anybody tell you to do that. So this sounded pretty good because he didn't go to any church. And he was a man of the highest principles of integrity and so forth. So this sounded pretty good, so I had dropped out of religion. So after Mr. my mother bring these things home to the house, She'd ask uh, me to read it, and I'd say, well, Mother, this is very beautiful. You know, I'm not interested in religion anymore. And I'd hand it back to her. 
Well, this went on for a little while, and then uh, we had moved to Tacoma, Washington. And one day my mother said to me, I want you to stay home today because I'm having uh, Mr. Wilhelm is going to be here in Tacoma. We had moved to Tacoma, Washington. And I want you to come and hear him speak. He's going to speak on the Baha'i movement. Well, I said, well, Mother, I'm still not interested in religion. I don't want to hear him. Well, I stayed home that day anyway, but I didn't go to hear Mr. Wilhelm. I went down in the basement to work in a woodworking shop. And there was only one entrance out of the basement, and I heard my mother talking to Roy in the kitchen. She says, Roy, Mr. Wilhelm, I want you to get down in the basement and tell Curtis about the Baha'i movement. <laughs> I knew I couldn't get out of the. Uh, I knew I couldn't get out of the uh, basement except I threw a door, so I was all fine for the while when he came downstairs. But he came down the stairs and uh, he didn't say a word about the movement. He began to inquire about this is a good point in teaching. He came downstairs and he talked about the woodwork shop. He, I had a bandsaw, a lathe, and the circus saw, and things like that. And I was making some furniture, and he made inquiry about everything I was doing in that shop. They became extremely interested in this woodworking shop. So I looked at him and I said, well, here's a guy that's not all cracked up in religion. Mm -hmm. And I struck a, up immediately a friendship with Mr. Wilhelm, which lasted until his passing in 1950. Then uh, he said, uh, Mr. Kelsey said, uh, I have a home in West England, New Jersey. And he said, I'd like to have a shop of this kind. If you ever come to New York, he said, I wish you'd come out and help me set up a shop of this kind. Well, I had no idea of going to New York, and I said, well, I'd like very much to do that for you, but I don't see any chance of my going to New York. Well, he said, you never know about those things. I thought it was a kind of funny remark to give, but I said, well, I might not know about it, but I don't see the opportunity to do it. But if I do, I'll certainly be glad to come see you. Several weeks after he left, my father transferred his business to New York City. <laughs> and I went off to Detroit, Michigan. I had been working for Ford Motor Company. And I went off to Detroit, Michigan, to work for Ford in tool making. I had been there for a couple of weeks, and I knew I had to have some social contact, so I again went back to the Unitarian Church, because there you could join that, you could believe what you please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after several weeks at the Unitarian Church, the minister announced, anyone who would like to stay after the service to hear a Persian speak, and when they mentioned Persian, my ears stood up. And he says, going to talk on the Baha'i movement. Now, this shows how things tie in. And uh, I decided I was going to stay. I was curious to say what this was going to be. And after the services were over, the, the church emptied out. One other man stayed and myself. <laughs> and the minister came down and he introduced us to Dr. Zia Baghdadi, a very well-known believer. Very dynamic personality. And then the minister came over and he apologized. He said he had had an appointment, so only the three of us were left in the church. <laughs> but Dr. Baghdadi, being the person he was, got up on the pulpit and he talked as if that church was full. I don't remember what he said. I was just keenly interested in the, the curious about a man talking about the Baha'i movement. Then several weeks passed and my father wrote to me from New York. He said, I want you to come east and visit the family. So I said, all right, I'll do that. It was around Christmas season. And uh, I made arrangements to go, and my foreman came to me and he said, Kelsey, he says, you'll have to give up your vacation this time. And I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Pulaski, because I already made appointments to go to New York, and I can't change my plans. Well, he said, you'll have to change your plans. I said, there's no such thing as after. I've made five plans to go to New York. Well, he says, if you do that, he says, you, you, you won't get $5 outside the Ford Motor Company. And that's when Ford had paid the $5 a day program that was supposed to upset the economy of this country, you know. And they had a welfare board at that time, which you had to account to the Ford Motor Company for the way you spent two dollars and a half of your five dollars. Oh. The welfare man came around about every three months. It had to be spent on furniture, clothing, something worthwhile. Otherwise, you'd be docked in your salary. Well, when he told me that I would, couldn't get that money outside, and being a young man and the world is your own at that time, you know, I said, well, now that's settled. If you can give me my time, I'm quitting. Oh, no, no. He says, you can't do that because he had to go and explain to the welfare board why I was leaving such a good job. It took me eight hours to get out of Fort Mordecai. But I went on to New York and I went to work for my father in the contracting business. And I stayed with that business until 1959. So, and much more money than I was getting with Ford Motor Company. I had been home about two weeks with the family and I came down with typhoid fever. 
and you have a very severe headache with typhoid fever. And my mother had, we were living in Van Portland Park at the time. My mother made me as comfortable as she could one night with ice packs on my head to stop this pain. And when she went to bed, it was so bad that I turned over in the bed and was pushing my head in the pillow to try to relieve the thumping and the pressure. And as I did so, I heard behind me a full piece orchestra. There weren't any physical instruments in the room, but it was as if they were there and beautiful music. And I swung around because I'd never had any experience like this, and the pain stopped instantly. And then we turned around as if the music floated away. And I called my mother, and she came running in, thinking something had happened to me. And she found me sitting up in bed. When I told her the experience I had, she went and got the Baha'i books. <laughs> and we, we sat up the rest of the night looking at the, this literature. And I wasn't looking at the literature, but what was in the Baha'i. I was looking because she said, there must be an answer to this experience in the Baha'i teaching. <laughs> and as I read it, I began to read these things. I said, well, Mother, you should have shown this to me before. This is wonderful. This is true. She said, I've been trying to tell you this for nine years, but you wouldn't pay <laughs> So for the next two weeks, I think there was, every Baha'i in New York came into the house. It was Howard Ives, Mr. Hooper Harris, Mary Hanford Ford, Mrs. Krug, and a whole host of other believers came into the house, sat on the bedside, and they'd bring books, and they'd try to find the answer to this experience, but they couldn't find it. And then the war came on, and I went to the First World War, and I took along an extra gas mask case with me, the hidden words, and another book to take with me. I thought it was a very easy matter to tell the soldiers in the company about the faith, but I soon found out that I was pretty well put in my place trying to tell them about the faith. But I met one young man who uh, became quite interested, and then our life was separated through the war. And when I was sitting in the restaurant in Paris later on, I looked up, and here was this young man I'd given a message to, and he came over across, and we met in the middle of the dining room. And the first question he asked me is, I want to know more about my movement. So there was one man at that time. Well, I came home from the from the war, and one day I was uh, down in Wall Street talking with Mr. Wilhelm. And he said, how would you like to go to Haifa? I said, I'd like nothing better, but I don't see any chance of my going to Haifa. And then he gave me the same coffee thing. He said, you never know about those things. <laughs> and uh, I left. We parted. We'd gone to lunch together. He was in Mr. Wilhelm's office at 104 Wall Street. was the one place that all the cables and the letters that the massive transfer uh, wrote to the friends in America came to Mr. Wilhelm's office in those days. It was a very interesting office. And uh, I later, this is why he was working on it. So I didn't, I passed it off. I said, I'd like nothing better than go. And about two weeks after that, three weeks after that, along comes a cablegram from Abba Hall. And all it said on it, Curtis Kelsey permitted. And with it, I got the strongest impression I had to act on that at once and get there as quickly as possible. And I set up about 25 days to get there. And uh, for the money, what to do about the money? I knew my father wouldn't uh, consent to this. He would think I was losing my mind. He wasn't a Baha'i, but he wasn't opposed to the faith. So I set about to get the money myself. I'd been working in the grocery store on weekends, and I went down to New Rochelle at a time to where I'd been working uh, with one of the boys around 6 o'clock, and I walked in and I said, which one do you suppose like to buy my Ford? I have a Ford model, T Ford. And uh, they looked, it was a busy hour, and they looked kind of sheepish at that time. I didn't say anything, and I felt kind of sheepish and started to walk out. Well, one of them ran after me and said, wait a minute, Kurt. He says, if this car of yours will climb a certain hill here, I'll give you $150 for it. And since I had just cleaned the spark plugs that afternoon, we went over the hill and high, and I had $150. <laughs> Then I sold a few other items. I got two three hundred dollars together. <coughs> I went down one day to see Roy again. And he said, how are you making out on your trip to Haifa? And I said, I'm doing very well, but not well enough. He said, well, how would five hundred dollars help? And he gave me five hundred dollars. So now I had enough money to make the trip to Haifa. So I said, I better go and see my father. Now, this is the next hurdle. So I had, went to see my father. He's in Woolworth building man. And I told my dad what I was going to do. He said, you must be losing your mind. He said, <laughs> he said here you are, a young man, going halfway around the world, and you're going over to do this work for this little old man over there, and they're not even going to pay you for it? He <laughs> <laughs> didn't know who Abu Bahal was. And I said, well, Dad, I, can't, I haven't time to explain to you, but I simply have got to make this trip. Well, he says, if you're going, he says, don't expect any help from me. And I said, as long as you don't object, I'm going ahead with the plan. He says, it's all right, but don't expect any help from me. I don't agree to such a thing. <coughs> so I went ahead. 
I went down and inquired about patches, and I found that I couldn't get patches as quick as I wanted to Haifa. So I said, well, give me a ticket to Paris, to Naples, to Brindisi, to Alexander, to Carmen, up to Haifa. So I got this ticket. And down at the steamship, there were many of the New York friends came down with letters to the master and other little gifts. And my mother and father were there in, within the audience. And my mother got me a graphics camera and some film. And my father came over and he handed me an envelope. He said, you can open this when you get on the boat. When I opened it, it was $250. So I wasn't going to help. Well, on to Paris. When I got to Paris, I made inquiry about sailings out of Naples and nothing doing. There wasn't any sailing out of Europe for, two, for Naples for two weeks. And he said, why don't you stay in Paris? It's much more fun in Paris than it is in Naples. And I said, no thanks, I'm going on to Naples. And I went on down to Naples, and sure enough, there was no boat sailing for two or three weeks, he said. So I said to the man at the steamship, well, I'll come in and see you tomorrow, because I'm sure something's going to happen. And he said, no, he says, don't do that. He says, we know our business. In case something happens, which won't happen, he said, I'll call you up. Where are you staying? <laughs> so I gave him the hotel, and I went back to the hotel. That satisfied me. And that evening, the phone rang, and I, I was called to the phone, and the steamship off. He says, how did you know the Asperia was going to dock here? I said, I didn't know it was going to dock here. He says, well, they dock here to let off a sick passenger. Do you want any passenger? I said, yes. And the next morning, I was on the way from Naples to Alexandria. And I was out playing shuffleboard the next morning on the boat, and a man came over to me and introduced himself. He was Charles Dana, head of the American Missionary Work in the Near East. He had to do with the spending of the funds to make the missionary work. And he inquired, he wanted who this young man was going over to the Near East, and he inquired, and I told him I was going to see, I used the title, Sir Abbas Effendi. And he said, well, I know some high youth at the University of Beirut, and they're very fine young men. But he said, the thing that puzzles me is that I don't understand how they're able to get so many Mohammedans to accept Jesus Christ. He said, what do you think about that? And I says, well, the one thing I have to think about that, Mr. Dana, is that the Baha'is do not tear down the life of Muhammad. They accept Muhammad the same as they accept Jesus Christ. And he scratched his head for a minute. He didn't say anything, nodded a little bit. He said, do you mind if I go with you to Haifa? <laughs> So I said, no, and we were companions through Cairo and on to Haifa, and he went up to visit the shrine of the Bob, and then went on to Beirut, and I never heard of him after that. Well, when we landed in Haifa, down at the railroad station, was uh, Dr. Latou Hakim and Kosro and Fujita. I have a picture of these three, of these two other friends that I'll show you afterwards. And they were down there with that little horse, high buck cord wagon, and they drove up, we drove from the railroad station up to the Pilgrim House. And when we arrived at the Pilgrim House, there was Enos Grave and Mrs. Cook at that time, and her sister, Indy Haggerty, and Madame Stanton, a woman from the East, a very wonderful Baha'i teacher in the, from the East. And we were just past the time of the day when out from the room in the side of the milk and milk house stepped Abdul Baha in his beautiful cream-colored robes and his white turban and the pair flowing to his shoulders, and he smiled, and he says, Mahabar, Mahabar, you are welcome, you are welcome. And then uh, we, uh, Fujita had just set the table, and on the table was a big bowl of plow with curried lamb and orange peel and candied orange peel and saffron over it. And there were bowls of must around the table, like our yogurt and chopped greens, and then little glasses of tea, which we don't have a half of the day, do they, Guru? It was a very beautifully set table. And then the master set us all down. He usually sat at the head of the table. I sat on this side, and Madam Standard sat here, and Mrs. Cook and her sister there. And when he sat down, he looked over at me, and he said, Did you notice how easy it was for you to come here? <laughs> and, I had, and I realized I had reached Haifa in the time that I had lauded for myself when I received that cable break. Every obstacle was removed. The master always washed his hands and rest out his mouth before he ate. The table. Fujita would bring him a pan of water and he'd wash his hands before he'd eat. And because sometimes we'd eat fish and he'd eat fish with his fingers and he said fingers were made before forks. Well, we had lunch and then he bid us rest for the afternoon and he had one of the boys bring in a branch of uh, tangerines on a, on, a, on a branch. You've seen that into the room and then uh, for, for many, many days after that we had uh, lunch and evening meals with that boy come over to the Western Pilgrim House. About 15 days went by and I hadn't been able to get started on wiring the shrine for which I'd come over there. Now the reason Mr. Wilhelm had asked me if I wanted to go to Haifa was 
that some time before he had spoken to me, he had read a tablet of Abdul Ha's in which Abdul Ha had spoken about the light of the Bab in the fortress of Shariq, in which he didn't even have a candlelight. And he mentions the whole world is flooded with light, and they're waiting for the one who in prison who doesn't even have a candlelight. And this so impressed Roy that he wrote over to Abdul Ha and asked if he couldn't send a lighting plant over to light the shrine of the Bab. And Abdul Ha wrote back, yes, you can send three. And Roy, being the kind of a Baha'i he was, he sent the three light plants over to Haifa. One was for the home of the master, one for the shrine of Baha'u'llah, and one for the shrine on Mount Carmel. So 15 days had gone by, and Abdul Ha hadn't uh, said anything about starting the work. And I knew, I didn't dare go ask him, because I knew instinctively he knew when to start, and he was very aware of what was going on, which I found out many times. And so I, but the, after 15 days, I began to be quite concerned. So I thought, well, I'll ask somebody else. So I asked his grandson, Rui Atman, who we were standing out in front of the master's home. And it's quite a distance from the center of the road through that stone gate to the front porch. You know the distance there. You're quite a distance. And Abdul Mahal wasn't anywhere around. And I said to Rui, when do you think the master's going to let me start this work? And he hadn't any sooner said that. And Abdul Mahal came out on the porch. He says, we will start tomorrow. And he smiled and back in the room. <laughs> I was delighted that we were going to start the work tomorrow. So but the next morning before Dr. Lafula Hakim and Fujita and I can get out of bed, there stood the master in our doorway of our bedroom. And uh, the corner of the room was on this side, the face of the room. My bed was in that corner, and Dr. Lafula was in this corner, and Fujita in the other corner. And the master opened the door and stood there. It was about 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we all made a big move, a quick move to get up, and he said, no rest. Then he turned to me and he said, I can't go to Akkad Day. What shall I do about it? And instantly I said to the master, when the master is ready, I'm ready. And he said, Dolly, and walked out. Well, I was disappointed that we weren't going to start that day, but that afternoon about 4 o'clock he sent word over to the Pilgrim House to get ready. We were going over to Akkad to start the lighting plants. So around 4.30, down to the railroad station we went, and Hyatt in those days was just like it had remained for centuries, a little village. And the railroad station had palm trees around it. They used to bring their candles in there in time to the palm trees. And the Arabs used to come in there. And it was a little narrow gauge Turkish railroad that went over from Haifa to Akka, went over in the evening and came back in the morning. So down to the railroad race station we went, and instead of Admiral Hall get on the tra- getting on the train, he sat down in the railroad station. And I remember the conductor was so concerned because he wanted to start, but he knew he couldn't start that train until Admiral Hall got on it. And he was, I saw him take his watch out two or three times, but he had to have Abdul Baha on before he could get off of that train. Well, pretty soon there Arab came in and he tied his camel to the palm tree and he went into the station and had a visit with Abdul Baha. After this short visit, then Abdul Baha came out and got on the train and off we go to Akka. Well, the train stopped a short distance out from the city of Akka those days and you had to be in Akka before sun went down and they closed the gates to the city and you'd have to stay out in the plane. Now, the plains surrounding Akka in those days were like the, the desert. They were, at night when the sun went down, you'd hear the coyotes howl after the sun went down. We weren't going in Akka, we were going inland to the Badji, about two and a half miles. Well, Abu again sat down in the station. And Rui Akna and I stood outside waiting for him. And the sun went down, and up comes a full moon. And it was a beautiful night with white clouds floating by. And pretty soon I see an Arab with a black abar coming over and a black turban around with a cord around his head and, and a, breaking over his shoulders. And he came into the station, and he, and he had a conversation. And then, in, in the meantime, come, coming through the dust was Khalid, a boy living in Cairo in, at the, at the Baji, and he was leading Abdu'l-Bahal's white donkey. And he came over where Rui and I were standing, and as soon as Abdu'l-Bahal had this conversation, he came up and he got on the white donkey, and then Rui and, and I walked along the side, and my rope walked on the right, and Rui and on the left. And as we walked along through the moonlight, Abdu'l-Bahal said, beautiful night, beautiful sky, beautiful moon. And then he said, are you finding it difficult to walk? And I said, of course, I wasn't even thinking about walking, going along there. I was so glad to be alongside Abdu'l-Bahal. Well, we made the distance to uh, the Banji, and at that time the mansion was not in our possession. It was in the possession of the half-brother of Abba Ha, and we had the corner building where Abba Ha used to go, and there were two bedrooms off, and there was a large room as you entered through the front door 
and uh, back of it was a little garden with an orange tree and off the right a kitchen where they cooked the food on charcoal and Paso had gone on ahead and he had prepared dinner again so here was his table set with a large bowl of plow as I described before and bowls of musk and beautiful grapes of the bunches of Damascus grapes and Persian melon on the table and Admiral Hall just commented upon these grapes these are grapes he says you don't get anywhere else they were very thin to skin you could eat the whole fruit it was so tender and as he was commenting on the break, someone rattled the door and had a crossbar on it. And he said, Bismillah, I'll be far me. And Kossel ran across and opened the door, and there stood a six foot two or three Arab, stood there grinning with his hand pulled across it. He stood right at the threshold, and Abdul Ha repeated to him again, Bismillah, I'll be far me. And he came across the threshold, and Abdul Ha sat him at the right hand side of the table. <coughs> And then they began a conversation in Arabic, and Abdul Hall pushed his turban back on his head, and to see the master laugh is certainly one of the wonderful places to see his him, the, the laughter of the master, and the interest he had, and this Arab was laughing, and Ruli Afan was laughing, and I was laughing, even though I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> and then pretty soon Ruli Afan turned to me and he said, this is what was going on. It seemed the master had said to this Arab, is there, isn't there a tradition in your tribe that if a father hasn't stolen something, he can't come in the tent. His wife won't let him come in the tent at night. And the Arab said, yes, this is true. And then that horse says, well, have you ever been kept out of the tent? He said, no, he had never been kept out of the tent. It seems somebody had been stealing Abdul Baha's sweet oranges. So then Abdul Baha asked him if he liked sour oranges. And the Arab said, no, he didn't like sour oranges. Well, Abdul Baha says, they taste very good with sugar on them. Two days later, the Arab began to steal Abdul Ha's sour oranges. <laughs> well, the next morning, <laughs> the next morning, uh, Abdul Ha said we were going into the near the property by the shrine to talk about where we'd put the lighting plant up. And he had a, uh, an elderly gentleman there. His name skipped me for this time, a man who had been with Allah in prison, who was a mason another man who was a carpenter. And he said, these two men will assist you in setting up the lighting plant and other things. And by the way, I have to go back to tell you, uh, Mrs. Goodall had sent a young man from the Boston Mag Magneto Works in the early days over to send those light plants, and Adam Hall sent him back. He was not a Baha'i, and Adam Hall sent him back. Hossein Karabai came from Persia, and he, Hossein Karabai means Hossein the electrician. And Adam Hall sent him back and said, when the time comes, he can come and help. So when I arrived, Hossein was there. So Hossein and I were, uh, went with the master into the garden back of the shrine of Baha'u'llah. And he asked me where I should, where we should set up a lighting plant. And I pointed out a place would be accessible to the shrine of Baha'u'llah. And he said, very well, use your judgment on it. And then he said, these two, gen these two men will help you with anything you need. And then he asked me if I would turn on the light and work on the plants so that they could be turned on at the same time. The one on Mount Carmel and the one at the Shrine of the Bob be finished so the light would go on at the same time. And then we went into the Shrine of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Ha stood at the threshold of the Shrine of Baha'u'llah and Rui Afnan and I behind him. And there he chanted the tab of the visitation, a thing, an experience I'll never forget forever. And then uh, after we finished the tablet of chanting the tablet, he turned to us and he said, he wanted all the things in the shrine of Baha'u'llah to be taken out. We were going to take them into the house of Abud and Akka. And of course, we at that time didn't know why this was being done. Later, I'll tell you why this happened. So we drove into the house of Abud, and there we had dinner. And while dinner was at dinner time, into the home came the chief of the Druids and his two sons. The father was in his 90s. And all during the dinner, this father was weeping, and the master was trying to comfort him. And I think this man sensed that this was the last time he'd see Abdul Baha, and anything Abdul Baha said to him didn't comfort him. But he would talk uh, gently to him and tell him different things about the faith and things like that. And then afterwards, when it dismissed, we and finished our dinner, then we rode back to Haifa by the way of the sea in this high buckboard wagon. You'll see a picture of that here. Halfway back, there was a beautiful sunset over Mount Carmel. And I asked that the Baha'u'llah if we could stop, and I took this picture, and it's one of the beautiful pictures that's going everywhere of this sunset over Mount Carmel. And then we got back to Haifa, and I uh, would spend two weeks in Haifa, working there on Mount Carmel, then I'd go over to Baji and work two weeks there to follow out the Master's command to bring them to the lighting plants at the same time. 
And every day at noon, when I'd be in Haifa, the master insisted on coming to lunch over there. And there'd be sometimes one or two pilgrims, sometimes just myself and Fujita, and sometimes Rui Akna. But the master would bring his newspapers and his mail, and the master had a brown cat was Fujita took care of. And Fujita and I would hide it every day, just here after the horse, they let the cat out. <laughs> and when we let the cat out, it would run across the room and rub up against his feet. And as the master would sit down by the side of the table, he'd read his mail, he'd feed the cat from the table. And I was stood there and the, sat there in astonishment many times, looking at this glorious figure of the master and the simplicity and wholesomeness of this life before me of the beloved master and see how there was a calmness in the presence of the master that is indescribable. You uh, you knew, uh, you sensed that you weren't worthy to be there, but he made you so at home that you could be in confidence. This is the beloved guardian did the same thing. Well, one day I thought I'd get a very quick answer from Abdul Baha on immortality. So I said to Abdul Baha, What's the difference in the life of the cat and the life of me? And he gave me a talk on, a short talk on how we eat food. <laughs> now, you might not think this applies, but you'll see that it does. <laughs> And he described how the food went through all the organs of the body, and the essence of the food purified the body and strengthened the body, and that was of no value was left behind. And I thought, well, this doesn't answer immortality. But when I began to study the kingdoms, the four kingdoms, and I saw this progressive step in the kingdoms, I saw this was an answer to immortality. But then he got up and he walked across the floor, and in the old pilgrim house, which is down at the left-hand side, the foot of Persian Street, the living room had a slate floor, nine inch squares. And as he got up and walked across the floor, one of these slates was loose and his foot struck it and it made a little noise. And he turned around and looked at it and he pointed to it and he said, it is progressing and it is possible for it to reach the stage of a mirror, a human temple. It shows how the elements can evolve into the human form. So that shows us the humility we should have and what we sit on even. All the elements that were in everything has the possibility of disintegration and through composition and evolution can pass into all kinds of forms. This is the immortality of this element. Well, years later I found much more on that subject, but this answered very definitely the, the question for me. Then we would, uh, one day he said to us, now, Tomorrow, an American lady is coming here, and I don't want anything said to uh, her about the Baha'i teaching. So, sure enough, the boat docked the next day, and this American lady came up to the pilgrim house, and had them all sat at the right-hand side of the table, and she began to tell the master who he was. He was Elijah, he was this, and he was everything else. She had him all wrapped up in everything. And he just nodded. At every statement she made, he just nodded her. He never had to talk. He just nodded her statements. She had a nice dinner. <laughs> and after the dinner was over, she asked if she could have a private interview with that one. And he said, yes, she could. And she walked over to the house with him. And we didn't see her again. But two days later, Mrs. Uh, uh, White, who was the one who challenged the will of the master, arrived at Haifa. And one day she... Uh, came home while we were up there, came up to the pilgrim house, and she was all excited. She came over to Abdul and she said, oh, I met an American lady down at the hotel, and she was so interested, I had to tell her about the Baha'i faith, and Abdul Hall, the Baha'i movement. And Abdul Hall said, did she ask you for money? And uh, Mrs. White says, yes, how did you know? Well, I saw this lady two days ago, and she asked me for money, too. And uh, Mr. Abdul uh, said, how much did you give her? She says, well, I, she gave me a, told me a hard luck story that she was stranded in the East and she needed about $100 to get back to America, and I let her have $100. Well, Abdul said, had you obeyed my instructions, you would still have your $100. He had given her money, too. So this showed, and later on, uh, shortly after that, the master, her government is over, and the master sent her away. And two days after her leaving there, she was, had reached Cairo was when the master passed. And she came rushing back, disappointed that the master had let her stay to witness his passing. You see, this is all a personal act. Well, uh, let's see, there's so many things. I, I'm trying to think of the different things. There's so many things that happened there in Haifa. We used to meet every uh, evening with Abba in his home on the right room as you enter the front of Master's house. The right room was the room where Master met with the men. 
And there were many at that time, many of the older believers who had been in prison with Baha'u'llah, and they sat around the wall, and they would never speak unless the master addressed them directly. And he would tell the stories of their cause, the history of the cause, and he would tell humorous stories. They would laugh at many of these times. And I was there every evening when that went on, but it was always usually in Arabic or Persian. Get in time? <coughs> All right. But I haven't begun to tell you half of it, but I'm only going to some of the others. You'll have to, have to continue it then. It's a uh, quarter hour. So he said he wants to stop promptly a quarter hour. Well, uh, I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll end with this one story and then we can continue at another time. But because there are many, many things I'd like to share with you that uh, show you this close connection that you all have with the Master. So, after many evenings sitting there in this room with the Master, he always sat in the corner of the room. And said, not you, you sit in the corner, you can survey the whole room. And the master would talk in the corner of the room, and I sat on the side of the wall. And one evening, he turned over to me and said, Do you understand what's being said here? I said, No, master, I don't, because it's in Persian or Arabic, and I don't understand these languages. So he said, Well, your heart does. And the language of the heart is much more important than the language of words. So you can see you can be with a person. There's communication between people. It doesn't take words. I rode one whole afternoon with the master. He never said a word, taking him out in the automobile. But I can assure you there was communication, there was a warmth, there was an understanding. Well, friends, there are many other things I could share with you, but we have to be prompt. Yes, I have yes, they were blue. And they, at times there was a luminous ring around his eyes. And uh, he looked at you. I tell you many things about that, but we have to stop.